Do you struggle with learning the rules of golf? Whether you've been playing for years or are brand new to the game, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to Golf Rules School podcast with Blakey and Marcella. Well, we are back for another episode. And this one, even though it's not so much rules, it's probably more important than the rules of golf, would you say? Yeah, absolutely. It's about your experience on the course and the experience for others that are playing golf on the same day. And we've had so many new players since really since COVID. There's just been an influx of players, women, younger people, just everyone A to Z has come in and which is great and exciting. Um, Khalid's on the cover of a golf magazine I just received in the mail. So DJ Khalid and his whole big initiative, which is amazing. It's great. But let's not forget that what you do on the course, your behavior, your timing or lack thereof affects everyone on the course that day that's playing behind you. And not even just that day, if we're talking about how you're treating the course, it can affect for days, if not a couple weeks, if you're not repairing damage or creating really bad damage. Yeah, if you create a divot when you're playing your shot from the fairway or even the rough, if you make a pitch mark on the green, that's when the ball comes and makes an indentation in the green. And even, you know, raking your bunker after you use it, not just raking where you hit your shot or where you stood, but, you know, walking into that shot and walking out of the shot, every part of the sand that you disrupted should definitely be raked back to the condition that you found it so looking after yeah. the course is is super important not only for everyone playing behind you but for you for the next day um, and the next week because if you're going to be back there again you want your conditions to be uh, you want your conditions to be fantastic so you enjoy uh, your experience out there on the golf course yeah. And, and if you're a golfer who's been playing a while, you really notice the difference on greens that are well taken care of versus, versus the ones that are really neglected. And it's, um, it's, it's pretty frustrating if you're a good player and you don't have a nice true putting line, it's, uh, because people are not repairing damage. And when you don't repair it that same moment, when it happens within a few minutes, it, it really takes a couple of weeks to rejuvenate and grow back and repair itself. And, and that's just, it's just a mess and nobody wants to, to, to play on that. So that's so important. And uh, Blakey, why do they call it a divot repair tool? If you're, if you're not fixing a divot, uh, that's a mistake. They don't call it a divot repair tool. They do, but they shouldn't, <laughs> is what I'm saying. They, It's a pitch mark. It's a pitch repairer. You can call it a ball mark. In the rules of golf, it's called a ball mark, which is fine. But you don't. there's no such thing as a divot on the green. Uh, it's a pitch There better mark. not be. There, there, is a, there is such thing, and you're actually permitted. So a, a, a divot is what happens when your club strikes the ball and or the ground in the ball and you make a hole, right? A pitch mark is when your ball lands on the green and makes a little indentation. So can you create, this is a good question of the week. Can you create a, a divot on the putting green? It's a trick question. Yes, you can. You can, you can chip. You're permitted to chip on the putting green. Should you? Well, if you're at that, uh, what's that course in LA? The one with the bunker in the middle that looks like a donut. Riviera. That's it. Uh, Riviera has a bunker in the middle. And there's a lot of times when people come up short on the other side of the flag, you know, of the other side of the bunker. So that the flag's on the other side of the bunker. And the only way you can try and hit this big looping putt, or you have to hit a chip shot. Or what Marcel is saying is, you can use any of your 14 clubs on the green. It doesn't just have to be the putter, but obviously if you do use a wedge or a nine iron, there is a possibility that you are going to make an actual divot on the green, which is not great, but considering the design of the hole, uh, it's a possibility. Yeah. Um, and if you and repair that, it, if you repair it well, it's... <laughs> So that's when you have a pitch mark repair and a divot tool repair. Is that right? 
<laughs> two identical ones that have yeah. different names. Yes. Different names. I, I don't like that. You know, you go on Amazon and you're like, I need to look for a pitch mark repair and it comes up with divot tool. And I'm like, oh, it's not a divot. Anyway. I know. I know when I teach my ladies in the girlfriend's golf experiences are like, Oh, a divot repair too. Well, that's not actually a divot, but it doesn't matter what we call it. As long as you fix it, you fix the damage you created. And when you're out in the fairway or rough or wherever you are, and you make a shot that creates a hole or a big tuft of grass goes away, this divot, um, some clubs want you to put that whole tuft back and tap it down with your feet. And there are some clubs, I think it's the quarry in um, La Quinta, California, the, the caddy is supposed to pick those up. You don't, they don't want you putting them back. He's supposed to pick them up throughout the day and put them in this little box <laughs> under the seat in the golf cart. <laughs> I know it's a wow. lot of work being a caddy over yeah. there. <laughs> it is. Yeah. So, so some kinds of, uh, some types of grass, and I'm not going to go into this, some types of grass stay together. Like they, they're clumped together when you hit the divot and those ones that's more like a cool season type grass and you just replace the divot maybe put some sand around it and hopefully the roots will start um just straight away just go back in and start growing where where there's other sort of the warm season grass you hit the ball or and hit the grass and just explodes it just there's no way you can actually replace it and so those ones more likely are courses that you're going to just fill in with sand and in the sand, uh, the greenkeeper would have put some little seeds or whatnot to help uh, germinate the growing of the grass on that divot. Um, so it starts straight away. Germinate. You sound like an agronomist. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, when we're on sort of on tour, uh, you know, you have those, you talk to those people. I talk to these people all the time. Um, they make up a massive part of the production team um, because you want the course looking stunning on TV, but you want the course, most importantly, playing extremely well for the players that are playing that day or that week. And where you drive your cart is key. You know, we talk about this in a lot more detail in our course, um, our paid course, but I can just hit on this real quick that where you drive, you're driving the car past the putting green. When you reach the green, you don't leave it short of the putting green and that's a pace issue. Um, and also when you're entering and exiting the fairway, there's usually stakes that show you where you're not supposed to be, or sometimes where you are supposed to be. And if they don't show you specifically how to get on and off, then try not to drive through an area that's already been, you know, has a bunch of track marks. It's already been driven through so much, go just one side or the other of that so that you're, you're not damaging even more that, that area. Just, I mean, think about that. And then having four, your four wheels of your golf cart on the cart path itself, the concrete, not kind of half off. Cause then you're just damaging all the grass right along the edge. And it, it you know, that that's just, it, it's not a good look. Yeah, you want to spread the wear when you're coming off the cart path, but when you're driving down the cart path, you don't want to spread the wear to the edges of the cart path. It just, yeah, it looks bad on the grass and grass turns yellow and stuff like that. Yeah, and that's not good. So that's important. And then knowing, um, let's talk about pace of play and knowing our position, what position is when you officiate on tour, you actually time put people on the clock. Yeah, we, and on tour, they have a lot more time to play uh, because we have a lot less players. Whereas, you know, at your local club, you might have 200, 250 people with an eight minute gap. Uh, and so everyone wants to tee off and everyone wants to finish. If you're the one that at 7.30 in the morning, yeah, you'll finish. But if you, if your game goes for over five hours, which is horrendous, uh, you've got to think that the people after you, their round is also going to be after five hours. And if they're teeing off at one o'clock in the middle of winter, they might not get finished and they're going to be pretty annoyed. So, you know, you've got to show consideration to everyone by playing, keeping up with the group in front. And if everyone, if every group keeps up with the group in front, then you should be playing within four hours, no problem. 
Yeah. So out of position and in position. So in position means when you are a foursome and there's a group ahead of you that's a foursome and you've arrived at the golf course early enough to get your stuff together, so to speak. Actually, I would use a different word, but um, you, you prepare, right? And then you arrive at the first tee or at the starter five minutes before that tee time so that you truly are ready with your golf balls marked, your tees in your pocket, your ball marker on your hat or in your pocket, handicap listed on your scorecard, all that's done, how much you're going to be betting for, all that stuff's done. And now you show up and you're ready to play. And if you saw that foursome ahead of you teeing off, then you should see them every time you're pulling up to an area where you're about to hit a shot, they should be leaving that landing area. You know, the the cart that pulls up first should really tee off first. Those two players should leap up and hit and then the next two so that you're ready to scoot out of there right away. And I also like to share with my ladies in my clinics that leave a little bit of space between your cart and the cart in front of you when you park it at the tee or at the green so that in case somebody's delayed, you can just easily pull around and leave. You don't have to be stuck backing up and that sort of thing. So that's, that's pretty important too. And what else would you say is a good pace of play um, gauge or tip The most important thing when you're playing golf is that you are aware, aware of when everyone is playing, aware when it's your turn to play, that's most important. And if your group starts playing a little bit slower, gets behind, it's your responsibility to catch up. You've got to see that, oh, that group that was on the green and we were waiting for a minute on the last hole, they're nowhere to be seen now. You know, they've already finished the green in front and teed off on the next hole. We are now out of position. We need to catch up. And then it's a case of just ready golf, playing when you're ready, when it's safe. It's also got to be safe to do so, but being aware that that person over there wants to play so that we can speed up, I'll stop and watch them play. Once people have played, they move down the sides of the fairway in the rough, Uh, on the cart path and allowing other people to play, you know, and playing while someone else is moving. Don't worry about being distracted. Uh, You're not that precious. You're not on tour. Uh, Just, just go ahead and play, you know, those kind of things to speed up is most important. Being aware of where your position is in the court on the course. Yeah, it's a little bit different for a lower handicap, a more skilled player who's shooting lower scores than it is for someone like my ladies that I teach at the Girlfriends Golf Experience that might be newer because we're not as much in control of our shot. And so if someone is slightly ahead of us and off to the side, we actually could pull it and hit them or hit, go off the toe and hit them over on the right. So we have to be a little bit more careful about those things. And I noticed when I play with men who are, you know, single digit handicaps, they don't mind where almost anyone is because they're not going to hit them just like the guys on tour. I mean, they've got all these people lined up on the left and the right. And one in a hundred thousand times you watch a round of golf, does someone actually get hit? But most of the time those people don't get hit because they're going to hit it perfectly straight and shaped the way they want. So just, we have to be careful about, about that because um, if, if your skill level isn't that high, then you do want to make, you know, be a little more cautious about, about that. And then sometimes ladies get a little more distracted with, um, with movement, but that's a, a feel thing to know the people that you're playing with and, and being considerate. And we talk more about that also in our competition strategies course, because there's a lot to that, but let me just say that in the rules of golf, now it's written in that you should play ready golf. And that means, as you said, play when it's safe, when it's not too distracting and when you're ready to go and just keep in mind that you do want to try to watch the shots, all the balls in the air until they land so that you're, that will help your pace too. Because when you see these balls land in the, you know, cross into a penalty area or potentially into a bush, it's a lot faster and easier to find the golf ball. Because once you get behind, because no one watched my shot and we don't know where it crossed and we take forever to find it, you know, maximum three minutes, of course. But um, once those happen, those things happen and we end up behind pace, it's really hard to catch up. And then it sort of steals from people in their 
composure time, their pre-shot routine. So just if you're keeping your chit chat to a minimum and you're showing up early and ready to leap out of your cart and hit all the time, you're ready to putt, even if you're not the furthest out, if you're ready, let's go. That's going to help give you that time that you need for yourself throughout the round and then be considerate of everyone behind you that day. You know, safety isn't really important, but you definitely don't want to be, you know, Marcel is there in the middle of the fairway hitting a shot and the three other people are within 10 meters of Marcel, you know, and their balls are further on. You don't want to be all grouped up together and just everyone watches as one person plays. You want to be moving towards your ball. You want to be trying to get the dead time out of the way while that other person is getting ready and then playing. And, you know, if you do have a golf cart or you're just walking your buggy or there are trees on the course, you can always stand behind them in case you think that you're going to be in in the way of a shot uh, of a missed, uh, miscued shot. So, uh, you know, you've got to be safe, obviously, but there's plenty of dead time that you can be walking to your ball, getting ready, putting your glove on, taking a club out, getting your yardage, all that kind of thing that, you know, even if you made up, if you look at it this way, if you averaged out the amount of time per hole and it was 14 minutes, that's around about four hours or four hours, 12. Okay. If you made up two minutes on every hole, you've just made up 36 minutes. So now you're at three out, three and a half hours. If you lose two minutes on every hole, it's over four and a half hours getting closer to five. It's making up two minutes is actually a lot easier than you think by just getting rid of that dead time. Someone gets to the tee while the others, are, you know, two people get to the tee while the others are still finishing on the green um, that they've, of the hole they've just played. Uh, they tee off. Those other two walk up. Uh, while these two are doing the scorecard and then they tee off, then they walk, everyone walks to their ball. Uh, You know, they walk down the side, but be aware. You don't walk down the side, just looking at the green. If someone's hitting you, you look around, you make sure that um, you can use the bag as a shield. Uh, And then once that first person hits, they start walking down the side and, you know, other little things like if someone's in a bunker and they hit it to another bunker, Maybe someone takes the rake and rakes the bunker for them. Uh, when someone's putting. Oh, on come the- on. Come on. Does that ever happen? Yes, it does. And it should. But isn't that funny? How many people sit there and just watch someone struggling and just, yeah. just watch them. Yeah. <laughs> it's like they're behind. It took them two to get out of the bunker. Now they got it. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Just go. Oh, hey, I'll grab it. Go ahead. Go, go get, hit your shot. I got it. How easy is that? It's like your punishment is I get to sit and watch you and laugh at you for playing out of a bunker (laughs) into another bunker. Yeah, that's, uh, we should, we should be more considerate. Well, while someone's putting, uh, this is not going to make up time, but this is a little caring for the course thing. While someone's putting, other people are looking around and fixing pitch marks. Uh, You know, there's a lot of dead time when playing golf. It's great to chat. It's a great sport for chatting, but you know, we can all do more than one thing at a time. Uh, Even the guys can do more than one thing at a time. So uh, I've I've seen it happen. So, uh, (laughs) you know, there's, it's, it's really the, what I want to leave you with is just be aware, be aware of what your responsibilities are, what your pace of play is and care for the course. Absolutely. And and watch videos on this topic and have conversations with other players, you know, especially people who've been playing longer if you're brand new so that you can really understand what that, what that pace should, should be and should feel like. Um, so let's talk about handicap for just a minute and explain kind of what it is and how you get one. Yeah. So handicap is a number that determines what your skill level is. Okay. So it determines And the great thing about golf is you can play, you know, a 10 year old can play against an 80 year old, a woman can play against a man, Uh, a professional can play against an amateur. It's all based on this handicap system. It's a huge asset of this world handicap system. Uh, 
and you can play, Marcella can play against Blakey in New Zealand, in Canada, in Scotland, all around the world using the same handicap system. Okay, it's worldwide now. And it tells and I you- I can win, I can win. Yeah, it doesn't matter where we play. Marcella with her bandit handicap's gonna win. <laughs> a sandbagging son of a bitch. <laughs> You think I'm going to edit that out? I'm not. That's staying. <laughs> I'm editing that out. You'll never see that one. <laughs> uh, uh, so, you know, so handicap is this whole, what is your skill level? Now, if you're just playing for fun, if you're just playing by yourself, if you're just playing after the competition field, fine. You don't need a handicap. You can just go out there. You're not, you might not necessarily be playing golf if you're not playing by the rules. Uh, but if you want to be competitive with yourself, so have, you know, this, a judge your personal best and then try and beat that every time you go and play. If you want to be competitive with other people, uh, you're going to need a handicap and you might as well get the World Handicap System official one. Uh, you can sign up with Girlfriends Golf. Uh, Marcella will help you out there for $50 US. And, uh, or you can, if you're in Australia, you can sign up with Wombat Hills Golf Club. Uh, that's 150 and, uh, ask me and I'll, uh, help you out with that one there. So, uh, it's easy to get a handicap. It just takes 54 holes of scores, either in three times 18 holes or six times nine or a combination of the two. And it's a Stableford score that's handed in or, in the US, it's uh yeah, it's just your score. It's just your score in the US. Yeah, it's a little different down down under, but uh wherever you are, you're collecting your scores for those 54 holes, and then you are signing up and getting your handicap. Now, what you get is called an index, and the index is portable, and an index goes out to a decimal if you're a 17.3 or 19.4 or 2.1, it goes to a one decimal out and that index is portable and it comes with you when you go to different courses. So if I'm going to play the black tees with Blakey one day, which God knows I would never do, but if I were, my course handicap would be different than if I was playing the red tees at that course that day. So your handicap will adjust depending on the level of difficulty and a couple of other factors of those holes um, uh, that day. And the other interesting thing is, so you, you adjust that or it adjusts um, and it's so important to know what your handicap is because any kind of money game you're getting into, whether if it's five bucks or whatever it is, you need to know your handicap. So that's one of those preparation things you want to just look that up ahead of time. In the U.S., we have the Gin Atch hat, <laughs> the Gin app, G H I N, which is uh, through the USGA handicap system. And I think you guys have something different in Australia, but you can look that up and know what that is. So when you show up, I know that I'm a 17 handicap that day playing from the tees we're going to play. And that's, it's just helpful to know. Yeah. That you take that index to any course exactly Marcella. And then there's a slope rating of a course and a scratch rating. You'll, once you get into it and get a handicap, you'll start understanding what that all means. But obviously the scratch, the higher the scratch, the harder the course and the higher the slope, also the harder the course in relativity between a low handicapper and a high handicap golfer. Uh, interestingly enough, Marcella, you say black tees. I actually looked at it and created a, uh, a, a course rating uh, for a course here in Melbourne uh, off the blues for the woman. And it was 70, it was a scratch rating of 79 when the par was 73 and a slope rating of 141. Oh. Uh, it was uh, very, very difficult. So your handicap of 17.3 you play that course and your handicap would be about 26. Yeah. So, so I'm going to get more strokes and, and, and that's what that number, that 26 means that I'm getting more strokes. Can you explain those strokes? Yeah, correct. So 
Uh, every hole has an allocation of the difficulty that it plays within, uh, one to 18. And so if you get 26, you get one shot on every hole, plus on the toughest eight holes, you get another shot. So you get two shots on the toughest eight holes. And what that means is getting shots and 26 and hole, you know, 18 and blah, blah, blah. What that actually means is if the par for the course has been decided as a par four and you get two shots to you for your skill level, it's now a par six effectively. So you're trying to have a six to play to your handicap. Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense. And someone else who's a scratch handicap only needs a four. So if you make a natural four and I make a natural six with two strokes on that hole or two dots on that hole, we have tied that hole. So Blakey, sometimes people think, oh, you know, it's this, my handicap number. I can't play to it. I never shoot that score. The reality is you're not really expected to play to your handicap all the time. So can you explain that? So your handicap is not your average. Let me repeat that again. Your handicap is not your average. You have 20 of your most recent scores and they take your best eight. That tells you something, okay? Take your best eight. Then there's a calculation that even gets it lower than that. So what it really turns out as if you're a low handicap golfer, you know, around scratch or a little bit above, you're going to play to your handicap around in those 20 cards around four or five times if you're a mid-range golfer you know 10 to 20 you're going to play the handicap around three times and if you're above 20 it's going to be more like two times or even if you're closer to 50 it's going to be one time okay so what that means is out of the 20 scores if my handicap is 25 I'll only have played to it once or matched it maybe once as well. So I've played to it, beaten it once, played to it once. And the other 18 scores will be worse than it, than though than my handicap. It's your potential. And if just a really quick as to why that is, if you think about it, if a 30 handicapper who has the potential to play out of their mind and play to a 15 they can beat their handicap by 15 shots. A five handicapper to beat their handicap by 15 shots would have to shoot minus 10, which as we all know, the better you get, the harder it is to get that lower score. So playing in the same competition, which is the great thing about the handicap system, playing in the same competition, it could be a scratch handicapper, it could be a 40 handicapper, you need to have the similar chance of winning. And someone who, if you played off your average score, that five marker, the scratch marker, could never compete against that 30 marker. So that's why the handicap is your potential best and not your average. That's just in a nutshell what the handicap system is. And, and the other thing is that it is a world handicap system now, effective 2020, and um, very helpful for everyone to compete, as you said, all over the world. And just remembering that, you know, we want everyone to get a handicap. We want everyone to play under the rules of golf. And that's great. Um, once you do get your handicap, you are required to have, you know, post a score for every round you play with someone else and you should be playing under the rules of golf. And if you start competing, people are going to be paying attention to that and noticing, and you're going to think they're, you know, we have a show, uh, years ago, there was a Mrs. Kravitz in the bewitched show. And this is a nosy neighbor. I don't know if you've ever, did you ever see bewitched yeah. in New Zealand? Okay. So this nosy lady, <laughs> and that's what you get is some, some Mrs. Kravitz's, but it's because they want things to be fair and they don't want you to become what Blakey called me, which was a sandbagger. And, um, so it's just important to kind of understand that and understand other people's perspectives on being fair. Um, those are kind of the key points, but we completely encourage you to get your handicap and to follow the rules and learn the rules because they are building your confidence and you don't want to have a disagreement or misunderstanding out there. Certainly don't want to be responsible for 
if you're in a partner or a four person team situation, do something that that's now going to reflect poorly on them. That's going to cause you to earn a penalty. So you're going to, you might think you're not ready for all of that, but it creeps up on you slowly. And you're like, Oh my God, I was so excited. I played in this event, this ladies guest day. And then this thing happened and I didn't know you couldn't take a drop here or that you had to do such and such. And so you just kind of want to slowly, you know, hopefully build on what we've, what we've shown you and taught you in this podcast series. And if you've enjoyed what you've learned, we'd love to hear from you. If you have questions, we'd also love to hear those um, go, uh, golf rules questions um, online on all the platforms is where you can reach Blakey and see his very advanced rules instruction um so if you're more advanced, jump over there. There's a ton of good stuff there. And then my girlfriend's guide to golf.com and on all the platforms where you're going to learn a little more foundation and get some maybe golf fashion thrown in there too. Thank you again for listening, subscribing, watching, and engaging in our podcast. It's a labor of love for Blakey and myself to be able to help people um, get some knowledge and feel a little more empowered out on the course. So thank you for being here. We appreciate it.